let's let's think about what cosine is. Recall that cosine is the x coordinate of a point on the unit circle. So if here we have our here we have our unit circle and we consider a point here on the on the endpoint, then if we measure the standard position angle here, and we start to write down some values, we can come up with a, with a graph. In fact, we can talk about theta, our angle, and we can talk about the cosine of that angle. So when our angle is zero, we're sort of at the home position of, of, our, of our standard position angles, we know that cosine has a value of one. And we know then that at a value of 30 degrees, which would be pi over 6, cosine has a value of the square root of 3 over 2. At pi over 4, at 45 degrees, we have a value of the square root of 2 over 2. At pi over 3, which is 60 degrees, we have a value of 1 half. At pi over 2, 90 degrees, we have a value of 0. So we can start to see the behavior of this function and see how it's a little bit different from, from the sine graph. So if we go ahead and plot those points on a curve here, on a, on a graph, we have our horizontal axis labeled at 1 and minus 1. Now we'll look at the values from 2 pi to 0. Notice that we start out at a maximum value, that when we're at an angle of 0 degrees, cosine has a maximum of 1. And by the time we get to pi over 2, we've reached 0. Right? When we've reached pi over 2, for our angle, we have an, an x value of 0. And then cosine becomes negative. And at pi, at 180 degrees, cosine has its smallest value. It's minus 1. It's all the way over to the left. And then the values start to come back. So this is a, a rough sketch of the graph of y equals the cosine of some angle theta, where this angle represents our or this axis represents our angle theta. If we now look at some of the properties of cosine, we can see some similarities and some differences between cosine and sine. One of the similarities we notice is that by the time we get over here, the graph has repeated itself. So again, we have a periodic function. And if you look at the difference between these two points, the difference again is 2 pi. So cosine has a period of 2 pi. If we look at where the roots are, if we look at where this crosses the x-axis, we see that it crosses at these two points here, at 1 pi over 2 and at 3 pi over 2. So the zeros, the roots, are shifted. Remember for sine, the roots were at every whole number of pi. Here we're at every half integer multiple of, of pi. So we can talk a little bit. We can list out where the roots are here. The roots of cosine of theta occur at theta equals, and I'm going to write this as 2n plus 1 pi over 2. And this is something you're going to need to get familiar with um, seeing this kind of notation because of periodic functions have infinite numbers of, of roots. Something like cosine has an infinite number of roots. We can't list all of the roots out by hand. We have to come up with some formulaic way of describing them. And this 2n plus 1 pi is simply a way of expressing an odd number. Okay, so this 2n plus 1 is guaranteed to be an odd number. Anytime we take some integer n and we double it, we're bound to have an even number. And if we take an even number and we add 1 to it, we end up with an odd number. So this is just a way of saying that, that the cosine function has a root whenever we have an odd number of pi divided by 2. We want to be careful because cosine certainly does not have roots at whole numbers of pi, even numbers of pi divided by 2, right? It does not have a root at 2 pi over 2 or at 4 pi over 2. So only when we have an odd number of pi over 2. And once again, if we think another similarity that cosine and sine share is the, is the amplitude. Cosine and sine both are bounded by plus and minus 1. They both fit within that, within that range. 
So another property we can state here is that cosine of theta has an amplitude of 1. So that's the maximum distance that it, it goes above or below sort of the center line, which in our particular case is the, is the x-axis. So how do we use these graphs to help us solve problems? Well, we can take a look, for example, at something like, let's find the sine of 24 pi. Now, 24 pi is a number we could get by counting through the unit circle. We would have to go through several times. And maybe you see that this is simply 12 revolutions. This is 12 complete revolutions. Since 2 pi is one complete revolution, we have 12 revolutions here. Another way we can look at this, though, is we recall that sine has a 0, has a root at every integer pi. So we can, we can say that this is 0. We can use our knowledge of the behavior of the graph to show that this is 0 or to, or to recognize that this is 0. Likewise, if we were to have something like the cosine of 11 pi over 2, can you figure out what that would have to be? So now we're talking about cosine, and cosine has a slightly different behavior than sine. For the cosine of 11 pi over 2, we're dealing with an odd number of pi over 2 for cosine. We know that that is a place where cosine has roots. Cosine has a 0 value. But what if we switch things around? And what if I asked you instead to find the cosine of 24 pi? And I asked you to find the sine of 11 pi over 2. What properties of cosine and sine would we be looking at? What kind of behaviors does cosine and sine have at those particular points? Well, let's think first of all about cosine of 24 pi. Cosine of 24 pi means we really have gone around 12 times. Cosine of 24 pi will be a little bit tricky to, to work with. We'll come back here and take a look at our, at our graph and see what we can figure out. In fact, our graph does not show us very much of, of cosine. So maybe we want to actually take and extend this a little bit and see what we come up with. Um, again, we're looking for we're looking for patterns here. So let's graph cosine out to a little bit out to a little bit farther distance. Let's go ahead and do six pi for cosine and see what kind of patterns we come up with. This is a, a nice way of of solving some problems, and it's also a way that you're going to need to get used to to working. Um, understanding and being able to work with these graphs is very important and we need, to, we need to be able to, to solve problems using these graphs. So I know that cosine, and here we're going to go ahead and graph y equals the cosine of theta. I know that it's 0 cosine has a maximum. I know that it has a period of 2 pi, which means that at 2 pi, at 4 pi, and at 6 pi, cosine will have a maximum, which means that 1 pi, 3 pi, 5 pi, cosine will have a minimum. This is what the graph of cosine looks like. And so you can see that we have a maximum at even pi values, 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi. And we have minimums at odd pi values, at pi, 3 pi, 5 pi, 7 pi, and so on. So if we want to answer our question now, and determine what the cosine is doing at 24 pi, cosine has a maximum. Cosine has a maximum at 24 pi, because it's an even number of pi, and cosine has its maximum at 1. Sine of 11 pi over 2, it's a little bit trickier question. Okay, and we, what we would need to do is go back and look at our sine graph and determine what the, um, what the values were for for sine at, at odd pi's over 2. Okay. When does it have maximums? When does it have minimums? I'm going to warn you that I'd like you to be prepared for this particular question in class. So take some time and figure out this problem as you, as you maybe work through this video again or begin the homework. Determine what the value of the sine of 11 pi over 2 is. 
So very basic introduction to sine and cosine graphs. As we go through this chapter, one of the things we will see is that we can modify these graphs by doing the transformations we're used to doing with other kinds of functions. And they give rise to different changes in the, in the behavior. So that is something that we have to look forward to over the next week and a half. This is the assignment that covers the material we have discussed in today's work. Please be prepared to work on this assignment when you come to class.